This is the Wellnergy Podcast. I'm Sarah Pickin Brown, integrated movement specialist, wellness coach of 20 years, and former pro athlete. Every week we get down and dirty with all things fitness, nutrition, and mental health related, with an array of special guests who share their incredible stories, nuggets of advice, and answer your burning questions. So grab that drink, get comfy, and let's dive on in. Well, welcome everyone. We have a special one for you today. So I hope that you are super comfy, that you've got your beverage of choice and that you're settled in and listening to this podcast on your preferred channel. I'm Sarah Pick and Brown, and I'm coming to you all the way from central London and joining me all the way from Queensland in Australia, where it is a lot warmer than it is here in London right now, is my very special guest. She began her personal training career in the UK after she graduated from stage and acting school uh, in Australia. This was during the mid 90s and at the age of 26, she fell in love with the sport of bodybuilding. Now between 2005 and 2015, she had competed and secured 18 shows under her belt, placing in the top 15 at the prestigious Arnold Classics in both the USA and also in Spain in the same year. Now, 11 years as an amateur level athlete and committed all the way, she achieved the ultimate honor of being granted her professional card in an International Federation of Bodybuilding, the IFBB. Now, taking a 12-month hiatus in 2018, uh, she came back stronger than ever with three shows that she competed at pro level in the bikini category. And she is now, as of today, after doing a little Instagram stalking, she is 24 days out of her fourth show. Uh, And she's looking sensational, I have to say. So it's with my great joy, I'd like to welcome this very special guest, our first guest for the Wellnergy podcast, my old competition stage rival, Ms. Katie Morris. Welcome. (laughs) How are you? Hi, I'm fantastic. It's really nice to connect with you. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Now, looking at all of the research that I was doing, I stopped competing, oh gosh, would have been about 2015 officially. And you've continued on. And I stopped competing because I was getting tired, girl. Like, you know, the body was not um, really responding the way that it had done, doing squats and things with lots of weights on your back. You know, knees were starting to feel it and that kind of thing. But you have continued on for the last seven years and are absolutely killing it. How's the comps going for you? How are you uh, enjoying them? Uh, Yeah, look, I still really love the stage. Um, I think anybody that knows me, Sarah, will will know that I've had the sport running through my veins for a long, long time. Uh, And I did fall in love with the sport when when I first competed, you know, all those sort of 16 years ago. Um, it's a it's a tough sport. It's not for everybody, but um, but it's it's something that I became very passionate about. So I, I always I've always had a little bit of a you know a, a philosophy with life that um, if you are lucky enough to find something that you're passionate about, then you should pursue it with everything you've got because not everyone is lucky enough to have to have that passion in life. And I I feel pretty lucky that I really had something that, you know, gets me out of bed in the morning and um, that I I just, I genuinely love the sport. So yeah, it's it's going great. I've um, I've enjoyed the transition into bikini. I loved my time in in the bigger division. Uh, I didn't personally want to be any bigger. So I thought, hey, you know, this might be an opportunity for me to stay in the sport, uh, continue getting on stage. But um, yeah, but, uh, you know, um, have a physique that I, I was more at that time had evolved into um, having an interest in looking a, 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 a little bit of a different way. Um, and I loved the idea of just being a little bit less muscular for myself. It was just a very personal decision. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I spent 2019 just, like, feeling that pro bikini division out and um, and it's been awesome. I love it. I'm, I'm so excited to get back on stage again in bikini in, uh, 
in 24 days time. In 24 days, yes, indeed. Now, this is an interesting question for you because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Every single person on the planet is being impacted by this terrible virus. And I know here in London, we're still in the midst of a lockdown that we've been um, pretty much housebound and only be able to go out to the shops for essentials. Um, all pubs, restaurants, schools are even closed. Um, parents are doing homeschooling at the moment. And that's been this way since December the 19th of 2020. How has the global pandemic impacted you as an athlete when, you know, I mean, I don't know how things are in Australia, but all the gyms here are closed. And uh, I really feel for people who um, are getting ready for shows. The whole year has just been completely wiped for them. How is it going for you? Yeah, it's been um, it's been pretty challenging, Sarah. I think uh, if I went back to the beginning of COVID, I was down watching the Arnold Amateur, uh, that Tony Doherty did everything he could to make that happen when his entire Arnold Expo had to um, be cancelled less than seven days uh, before it happened, the entire Arnold Sports Festival. So Tony moved hell and high water and got that Arnold Amateur show happening in a random suburb in the back of Melbourne in a shed. Um, and his production team put this absolutely outstanding show on to allow those people that had spent probably the last 12 months working towards turning pro um, an opportunity to get on stage and, and make that happen for themselves. So he really is all about the athletes. Now, that next day was the Monday, the 23rd of March. And I was at Doherty's having a workout before 12 o'clock and at noon, the gyms all closed. So I was due to go home that afternoon and had to change my flight and rush home before the borders closed mm -hmm. um, uh, and lockdown started. And, um, and I was potentially going to be stuck in Victoria and not able to get home. And I got a WhatsApp message at three o'clock in the morning from the manager of World Gym Castle Ray Street, which was right at Sydney CBD, where I was PTing at the time and coaching at the time, saying it was very, it was actually very sad, saying um, it was a video message saying, hey, guys, you know, just jumping on, like, you know, I, I hate to, you know, to, to make this video, but we've got to close tomorrow indefinitely. Um, you know, we like, we're going to take care of you guys. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. But you know, the gym needs to close tomorrow at 12 o'clock. So if you've got any belongings, please come and get them tomorrow morning, et cetera, et cetera. Now I was in Melbourne, so um, I got very scared and I had a little cry and and I saw Tony and Tony said, Katie, everyone's in the same boat. It's going to be all right. Just go home and, you know, like follow the rules and it's, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. So... Uh, I went home. I live in a studio apartment, so I spent the next three and a half months pretty much by myself in a studio apartment, not even really allowed to go for a walk with really anyone. Um, my mum was high risk because she has a bad heart, so I couldn't really even get in the car and drive to see her. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very isolated, Sarah, um, and very challenging. My, um, my owner manager of the gym that I was working at at the time knew that I had my eye on this show that I'm about to compete in was meant to happen last October. Oh. And he knew that I was, he knew that I had my, um, my eye on getting on that stage in October and it was now the end of March. So he was very accommodating and on the quiet, he said, you know, come down to the gym and um, I'll loan you an Olympic bar and um, a handful of 20 kilo plates so you can hip thrust your little heart out on your balcony. And, uh, and that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I, I just got on my balcony three days a week and I just hip trusted and hip trusted and hip Because <laughs> we all know that it's all about the booty with bikinis. So. Well, you know, so looking at your photographs, I have named you the unofficial, it should really be official, but the unofficial glute queen of Australia, by the way. Oh. Your, your buns are definitely made of more than steel. Uh, they're just incredible. <laughs> Look, if I'm holding my own with the bikini pros, then honestly, that's all I can hope for. Uh, I got my, I was able to continue the nuts and bolts of bikini off season training um, at home on my balcony. And Sarah, I just was like walking for literally between two, two and two hours and two hours and 20 minutes. I would go from Darlinghurst, this was like in the mornings to 
you know, to, to stay active and to keep my mind healthy and, and also to keep my body moving. Um, because I was, to be honest, I was petrified of putting on weight. Yeah, sure. Um, because I never had a gym to go to, and I had this idea that I was going to get on stage, you know, and I, I need to be small when I'm on stage in October, which wasn't that far away from the end of March. So mm -hmm. I really was quite um, uh, nervous about putting on weight in lockdown. Um, I must, I have to be honest about that. And so I used to go for these epic walks all around Sydney Harbour, right down to Walsh Bay, pretty much almost to. Um, uh, hang on, around Circular Quay, around uh, pit, like where all the piers are. Yeah, so Walsh Bay, mm -hmm. around Walsh Bay, and then down to almost down to Darling Harbour, and then mm -hmm. around this little circuit track, like a Aboriginal reserve, and then around, and then all the way home. It used to take me between, I think it started um, two hours and 20 minutes, and then eventually I was getting it done in two hours. And I did that every day of lockdown in Sydney. Moved to um, the Gold Coast uh, on the Wednesday, the 12th of June. And when I came up here, it was really funny, Sarah. It was like, um, so I, I, I survived through the Sydney lockdown because um, I just kept myself busy. And also I had signed up to, the, to study the Precision Nutrition online nutrition course, that Canadian course. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a fantastic course. So... I was sinking my teeth into that every afternoon and then I would film my workouts on the balcony uh, and then I would I would come into my desk like, you know, at five o'clock in the afternoon and I would edit them and post them up on Instagram um, because I knew everyone would be feeling the same way, you know, vulnerable and scared of putting on weight and just all those people that go to the gym every day, like we're going to feel really lost. So I tried my best to connect with people that I knew would um, benefit from that through Instagram Live. Uh, and that seemed to be going really well. People were messaging me saying they were, you know, um, they were enjoying the videos and they were, you know, it was a nice way to connect and all of that. So that was that was really cool. And then I got up here and it was just like, um, so for anyone who is in another country, Sydney to the Gold Coast, probably driving is like 13 hours, um, maybe an hour and a half on a flight, but I drove. So I drove 13 hours and then I got to the, to the sunny Gold Coast and it was literally like, there was no COVID. It was really strange, Sarah. So when I first got here, the only thing that um, that Queensland had was like little stickers, you know, if you went to the supermarket saying, stand here. The gym was sectioned off into like the leg section and the chest and back section and, you know, the other section and the cardio section. And you had to sign in to like a register at the, um, at the reception at the counter. Mm -hmm. And you had a, a time slot. So you might have like, okay, Katie, you're signing in to train legs on Saturday the 10th of June. Um, you've got the 10 o'clock slot and you have to be out at 10.15. And then the um, the work, the staff of World Gym would go around the gym and they would clean that section, all the sections for that 15 minutes. And then the next um, time slot would go in. So that's how Queensland were doing it. And then about... Four weeks after that, not even, I don't even think I did that for four weeks, Sarah. I think I did that for maybe two, two and a half, maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the t I came to work one day and the tape was all gone. Outside of the gym and, you know, the stickers on the floor at the supermarket, honestly, it was like there was no pandemic. It was really, it was really strange coming from Sydney I in a good way. Yeah. In a good way. Wow. Yeah. No one was wearing masks in Queensland, Sarah. Nobody. Oh, my God. At all. So obviously coming to Queensland, yeah, obviously coming to Queensland, um, you know, I went straight into, you know, business as usual with my training. So it was, yeah, it was great. Um, it was, Sydney was a bit tricky. Um, Sydney was, I was very isolated and I, I'm fortunate to, um, to have quite good mental health, Sarah. So I didn't really struggle as much as I know a lot of other people did. Um, I know the suicide rates in Melbourne like skyrocketed and it just it just would break my heart reading the stats but um, I was okay like but I, I, I made a, um, a conscious effort of keeping myself very busy and doing very positive things and I was meditating every day as well Sarah and that was helping my that was that was helping yeah, sure. Now, tell tell me a bit about that because I, I did read that you you have that as part of your routine, and I know that people will be 
absolutely fascinated from, um, you know, just despite the, the global pandemic, that, that has obviously shifted some of your prep routine because obviously we've never been in this situation before. But in general, can you give the listeners a little bit of an insight into what a day in the life of an IFBB pro bikini athlete is all about from your perspective? Yeah, so inside prep, um, it always starts a little bit earlier. So I'll just give you, you know, my like today or yesterday or my day at the moment. 4.45, the alarm goes off. Um, I'm about three minutes walk from the beach. Uh, I live at Burley Heads, which is a beautiful part of the southeast um, coast of Queensland. Uh, not too far from the border, probably 20 minutes in the car. Um, yeah, probably 20 minutes in a car to like call and go to Tweed Head, so the New South Wales Queensland border. And um, it's a magical place. It's very pretty. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I get down, I hit the pavement probably at 5 a.m. And I walk um, either down to Talabadra, which is south, or I walk to Miami Lookout, which is north. It's just like a, you know, a, a, a typical esplanade along the beach. Um, and I walk for 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. And then I take my shoes off and I go down to the sand and I've got a little spot and I do my meditation. And um, that's been, uh, that's changed a little bit um, in the last kind of handful of weeks. So now it's more um, focused on, you know, manifesting your desires, law of attraction, like really like getting um, in alignment with um, the things that I want to attract into my life. So more specifically to do with, my competition and how I want that to look for myself as a, as an athlete. Uh, but prior to that, it was always just, um, meditate. Um, yeah, just, just meditation in general. So, uh, things that I would meditate on would be, um, just inner peace, uh, you know, getting still, um, love, abundance, like relationships, just, just nice stuff. And, I think the the handful of conversations I've had with people about meditation over the last couple of months and when they ask me questions, I, I think the one thing I say, Sarah, and it, this probably sounds very contradicting to the external, you know, so-called narcissistic self-involved, like, um, world of bodybuilding, which I know that most people believe that it's all of those things and nothing else. I know that they do. Um, I connected to heart. I connected to heart. Meditation helped me to connect to heart, Sarah. And I know it. I know it sounds like, oh uh, yeah, like here we go. Like, but it really did. So that's something that um, I, I, I've gotten more still. Um, I feel like I was much more erratic, like a handful of years ago. Like you know, and. Uh, definitely emotional maturity. You know, you go through life experiences as well. You know, there might be, you know, like relationships or like, um, you know, broken heart or like just anything in life that may, that makes you feel negative emotions and coming away from those things, you, you know, healing is a really important part of um, being able to move forward in your life and, you know, and maintain a, a positive outlook on life. And uh, yeah, I just have found that, that's like, that's where meditation has come in for me and it's helped me a real lot. And I've really gotten um, um, more, it's hard to explain, Sarah, like when you haven't done meditation, but when you get right into it, like it, like meditation gives you a stillness. Absolutely. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quietness. It's kind of like, it's, it's the stillness. That, that's the best way I can explain it. But definitely it's helped me to really like connect to, to heart mm -hmm. and I'm more, I'm just, it's just changed me. It's just, you know, it softens me, Sarah. Yeah. Which is, it's which is really interesting. I think that from a, um, the, the general perspective around particularly women in the sport is that they're really hard and um, yes, their bodies are very hard and your body is like, you can bounce quarters off your body. But it's also a, a still a, a, a softness, emotional softness that needs to balance out the drive. It's a balance of the masculine and the feminine energies within the body. And it's really interesting to hear you say that because I don't think that many people out there observing figure or bikini or, or the bodybuilding in general would, would necessarily put the two together. And yet it's so essential. 
Yeah, I think it's um, it's quite important as well. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time listening to um, a guy that is on Instagram as um, his handle is Stefan Speaks. And I don't know if you know about him, but he's like an African-American guy and um, he talks a lot about feminine en energy, a lot. And everything that he has to say on it is very, very interesting. And I know for myself, like, my own awareness of that that came along more recently than not. Um, I was I was that that female athlete with a lot of masculine energy, Sarah, and and that's okay. There's no self judgment or judgment on others when I say that, but um, it is something that I've learned. I've been learning a lot more about, and um, myself have been making an effort to really like embrace and connect with that feminine energy, like more so probably over the last like. 12 or so months but definitely like since I've moved to Queensland because I've been spending more time learning about it okay yeah and I do think I do think it's really important to balance those mm -hmm. those two especially when you're because the way that he talks about it is he he explains that strong ambitious women that are driven that are all about chasing their goals which is like me all over and I've always been that way um sometimes find it very hard to switch from the masculine energy that allows them to be so driven mm. and to come back to their feminine energy mm. in their relationship, in their personal life, in their in all the other areas of their life that isn't them chasing that goal, if that makes any sense. Mm. And and they they lose that sense of understanding how to transfer between the two and and it actually becomes a problem. It can become a problem. Yeah, no, for sure. It's really. Yeah. And when you say it can become a problem, was there a particular situation or, or light bulb moment for you where you stopped and went, oh, hang on a second, I need to address something here? Was there anything in particular? Um, look, there was probably a couple of things. Like I've always been, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm always really in my zone when I'm in the gym. You know, I don't talk. I'm not smiling. I'm not, like, stopping for a chat. I'm not asking people how they are. Like, I'm just it, – it's just a job to me, Sarah. Yeah. And, look, I still do that, um, but I'm, I'm mindful of how it looks now. Mm -hmm. And I know – I don't know. It, it's a real tricky one, Sarah. Like, uh, I just kind of remember back to when I was trying to turn pro in the figure division and – you know, I was in the gym grunting, like, like grunting like a man and, you know, throwing weights around and, <laughs> and I just kind of think back and I'm like, oh God, like it's so, it was so, it was a lot of masculine energy, like, and that's okay. That was part of the, you know, the journey and all of that. But, um, so that was something I was mindful of because people don't, understand it and people don't relate to it like they don't know why you're doing it like you're you're doing it you know you you know why you're doing it but the people around you they don't understand why you're doing it and can be it can be really misconstrued Sarah mm. and probably um, a bit terrifying for people watching really terrifying for people <laughs> watching um so yeah so there's that so I was very aware that that was some that was that was me in a gym and I didn't I didn't necessarily like the way that I know that it would impact other people or how people would respond to it. Um, well, this is like, this is some really honest, transparent conversation, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was one thing. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think Sarah, it would have transferred into across into my romantic, into my personal life as well. Yeah, sure. And, and 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 I don't think in a good way. I don't think in a good way. Energy, you know? Yeah, like absolutely. Energy. Oh. Like too like too hard too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Too it, it too is. masculine. It sounds it sounds yeah. like through through the journey of, of the competitions and, and I always when I was competing I always claimed that every single year that I stepped on stage, whether it was a couple of times in that year or pretty much any time I stepped on stage, there was, it was always going to be different. There were different things that I would learn about myself and myself relating to the world. Um, 
and and it really was this sort of petri dish of um being able to observe yourself and how that relationship to the world and the people in it played out and it sounds like very much through the course of your journey in in competitions that you're um diving a lot deeper than the physical and and interestingly enough i mean in yogic terms they talk about that we dive into ourselves and we go through the different layers from physical to esoteric or, or more um, um, in, intangible types of energy, which is, is what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And it, it really does require you to dive deep into yourself in order to then, I guess, blossom or flourish um, in the physical because everything in the eternal is aligned. And it sounds like you've definitely gone through a huge transitionary period, certainly in the last 12 months as well. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been a journey, but a nice one. Yeah, a not, definitely a nice one. And it does, you know, it does, uh, there's, I think one of the things, Sarah, that instigates some of that is, you know, you're like, Self-reflection is very important. And I think when you get older, you realise that you you need to be self-aware. Like it, it's really important to be self-aware and it's important to know what the you experience is like for other people. And, and all of a sudden that stuff becomes important. Like whereas maybe it, it wasn't important to you pr previously. You know, for me now, it is important. Like the, the K experience for other people, I'm aware of that and I'm mindful of it and I want that to be positive for those around me um it's not it's not just me like doing my thing it, it it's it's bigger than me Do, does that sort of make sense like yeah and it, it also what that highlights as well as the fact that um within the sport as you mentioned before yes there are people who do come at it from an extremely narcissistic perspective and it is all about them but there all also is the athlete such as yourself that can achieve to a very high level. And it's not about all about them. It is actually, as you say, about the experience of and that we're all in this together and, and what's the experience that you're having and I'm having and are we all having a nice time, basically. <laughs> so really yeah. Amazing. yeah. So what what yeah. um, what would you what advice would you give to any female competitors or potential female competitors that are looking at at um, going down the track of competing, what would you say to them? Oh, <laughs> this is Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe two things. What two things would you say to them? Okay, um, I I'm gonna say like what I what I was just kind of touching on is is really important. So. I would say if girls are looking to come into the sport, like, and look, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my hand up and say, I, I'm, I was, I was this, I was this person, right? So, this is not me pointing the fingers at anybody else. This is literally me saying, I, I, I was this competitor and I was this athlete, and I, I believe absolutely that I'm not that same competitor anymore, and I have evolved. But it's very easy when you're ruthlessly pursuing a competing goal. And it is a little bit of a solo sport. I don't really care what anyone says about, oh, but, you know, it's a team of people that get you on stage. Yeah, it is. You've got the lady that makes your suit and you've got the person that does your shoes and you've got your coach and your posing coach. And But you're the one that has to stay on the diet. You're the one that has to get eight hours sleep at night. You're the one that's got to get your ass out of bed in the morning when the alarm clock goes off at some silly hour, seven days a week for 16 weeks. Like, Nobody else does that stuff. Now, along the way, you can get very um, single-minded with your goal, and that's okay. That allows me. That allowed me to turn professional because that's the exact reason that I turned pro in the IPB because I was so single-minded. Nothing else was more important than me becoming an IFBB pro, and that's why I got there because I just wouldn't give up, Sarah. I was like, I'm going to do this. Just don't give up. I'm doing I it. you on stage. I remember competing with you and you did not give up. You were a tough no. competitor, my dear. You really were. So <laughs> absolutely. It, that, that do not. Thank you. Give not anyway, an inch. so. Yeah. What's. Uh, the give not an inch and, and never so, give up. So, yeah. So I, 
No, no, and it's drive. Like it's it's it's. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to say that it's a bad thing. I just think. Um, okay, okay. This is how I'm going to say it. If you're beginning your um, your career in competing, like I just think that if you know that that's you, and you're um, you're ruthlessly pursuing that big goal of like becoming an IFBB pro or like whatever it is, just try and have some awareness of what's going on around you. Like be mindful of how you treat people. Um, be grateful for all the people that are putting up with you when you're like a moody cow because you're four weeks out um, and you're irritable and people that are making allowances for you wherever you work because you've got to eat meal four at 3.30 p.m., and your family that are probably copying it left, right and centre because you're hungry and you're tired for 16 weeks, which is a long time, let's be honest. Four months is a big chunk of like a year. So that would be the first thing I would say, like just try and just like be a bit self-aware but aware of like what's going on around you when you're in that process of ruthlessly pursuing that goal because that's something I think I, I was miserable at in the beginning. Uh, and I, I learned along the way and I did, I learned the hard way. I learned by, you know, hurting people and treating people not, not the right way and all of that as a competitor. So I did learn the hard way uh, and, um, you know, but it, it was a happy ending. So, but yeah, that's something I would say is super duper important, Sarah. And then the other thing I would say uh, definitely, definitely is, um, and I'm sure that no one will mind me saying this because this is absolutely reality. From 2007, so two years after I started, all my shows were in, uh, international, right? 95% of my shows were international. The only time I've done a show here since then is the Arnold Classic in the Pro Figure Division in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Now, that comes with a big price tag. Mm -hmm. So, again, something that I... I, I don't think I did the right way was when you're in an actual contest prep. So say, for example, your contest prep is 16 weeks and you know that you're going to Spain and then you're going to fly over to Poland, you know, do these amazing international shows and you've got all the invitations and you're all excited and your suit designer made your suit, all of that. It's going to cost you a lot of money. So I just think like if girls um, are aware that if you go overseas, like literally, I feel like it cost me $7,000 to do one show uh, 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 offshore. Okay. Yeah. So what you, so the way to do it is you get that money together before you start the prep. And then you get on the plane and you go and do your shows. Not the other way around. Don't come home like with five bucks in your back pocket like wondering if you were a personal trainer, wondering if you still got clients because you've been away for two and a half weeks. Like, don't do it that way. I did it that way. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So you've got to make your money in your off season, like save your money, save your money, save your money, and then go and do your shows. And then come back and refocus on the things that you couldn't focus on when you're in prep. Like refocus on that stuff straight away. Give all your time, you know, that you didn't give to your partner, to your partner. Spend more time with your, you know, your your loved ones, your, the people that probably carried you through some of your shit days in prep. Mm. Um, you know, get your money saved. So if you know you're still competing, when it's time to next compete and you do have an opportunity to go overseas, you can just like jump online and book your flights. Literally that day. You don't have to worry about funding it you know, or relying on sponsors that are going to pay, help you to pay your way to like go and do your, let's be honest, your hobby. Mm. No one's getting paid, Sarah, unless you're Miss Olympia. Yeah. So that's they're the two things. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Really interesting, very, very insightful um, tip there. And I, I would definitely agree with you. Um, the money side of it is particularly from Australia as well. Australia is very long way from the rest of the world. And uh, yeah, it, it is costly. And I don't think people really realize how expensive the sport is before they get into it. Um, now you've mentioned obviously that you're a personal trainer, that you run your own business. Now being a top level athlete and running your own business, 
Talk to me about that. How do you balance that? How do you balance maintaining your client base? How also has it potentially changed with this pandemic? Um, yeah, look, the pandemic has affected things. People don't have... Um, so obviously personal training is a luxury spend, Sarah. People um, don't spend that money unless they know that they can spend it. Uh, and when someone is tightening the purse strings, one of the very first things to go is a personal trainer, which is me. So, um, yeah, it's been tricky. Uh, I, I didn't anticipate for the business building phase to be as, um, as challenging or as slow as it has been for me in the Gold Coast. I'm still very much in the business building phase of, of things at, um, at World Gym Ashmore, which is more of a like hardcore bodybuilding gym. Um, and I don't really know, I haven't really pinpointed what it is yet. I think, I think it's a combination of three things. I think number one, it's a gym with a lot of very serious experienced lifters in it. So not as many people need a personal trainer. That's one thing I really believe, like, it's got a lot to do with it. Number two, I've walked into a gym where there is a lot of, I would say, a handful of Australia's best coaches. Number three, yeah, people were affected by, um, by the pandemic. People lost their jobs. Some people were on um, benefits. But over the last five months, the four months, the benefits have been scaled back. And so that would be a perfect time for you to say to your trainer, oh, I had the extra money because I had benefits, but now I don't, so you've got to go, you know? Um, so I kind of feel like it's a combination of sort of those three things. The, the deeper I get into prep, the more my focus goes onto prep and off building my business, not off looking after and servicing the clients that I have, absolutely not because I know how important that is. Like that's, that's important for two reasons. It's important because, uh, you know, to maintain integrity in the coaching space, you need to service your clients like at a, at a, you know, at a high level. So from a integrity perspective, it's important, but also that that's your bread and butter, Sarah. So if you, ca if you can't service the clients you've got when you're 10 weeks into prep and in a calorie deficit and depleted, um, then you're not going to end up, you're not going to have any clients left. Absolutely. and, and that Because is, they're paying a lot of money for your services. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so we're still building, but um, we'll get there. And, and definitely like the minute that I get off stage, my 100% focus will be, will be on business for a, you know, for a good six months. Yeah. Yeah. The minute that you get off stage though, what's the first thing that you do? <laughs> have a glass of what wine eat? what do you eat <laughs> oh no it's really changed um hey. oh my god yeah no no i do i eat chocolate as soon as i come off stage it's in my bag oh wonderful yeah. cookies 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 any favorite in particular like chocolate chip cookies chocolate chip cookies so they're they're the one i love it a little confession here to you. I was doing a little Instagram stalking the other day to get ready for this interview. And um, I noticed that you were having a couple of glasses. Was it a couple of glasses? Might only have been one of wine. And you were four weeks out prep. Now I want to ask you about this. <laughs> Talk to me about this. This, this is fascinating, is fascinating to, me. to me. Yeah. It's, um, it's 85 calories in a small glass of, you know, like rosé or red wine or and yeah, and it would, in prep, it would only be one glass. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I have a glass of wine, like, and I don't, I don't feel bad about it. I don't, I, I, do you know what, Sarah? I kind of factor it in. Okay. Yeah. So you balance it out. And when would that stop? At what point would that, that particular inclusion stop? Normally six weeks out, but this time round, um, I've been making progress uh, each week with my skin folds and I haven't needed to take it out. So um, yeah, I, I, I will have one most like most nights, like at dinner time. Okay. It's not a it's not a bucket of wine. Like it's just a little glass of, you know, a little glass of red wine. Like so and just, that's my that's thing. 
because you mentioned skin folds. I know what skin folds are and I know how often I used to get them done. Just for those of people who are listening who are like, what are skin folds? Can you explain that for them? Yeah, so um, when you're dieting, the body has subcutaneous fat and, and in English that basically means that, that um, someone comes along with, uh, with a little um, plastic device or a metal device and it kind of looks a little bit like tongs mm -hmm. and they, um, they pinch certain sites on your body. So they might like pinch like the back of your arm, like where traditionally where body fat would, would store and then like the upper back, like just, um, you know, above your shoulder blade. And then like your lower back, maybe the front of your quadricep and maybe your calf and then just like down um, to the side of your belly button, like your, um, your abdominal section. So um, a traditional way of doing it would be like five different sites and then you would just have someone that was very experienced with this technique to pinch those sites every single seven days um, and you get a total of, uh, of skin folds in mils. So, you know, the tricep skin fold, for example, this pit might pinch at 6.3 and then, you know, the abs might pinch at like 3.8. And then each week, uh, if you're on track and your, your nutrition protocol and your cardio protocol and your weight training and it's all lining up and your hormones, uh, everything is like, you know, working in unison, mm -hmm. um, then those numbers should, generally speaking, those numbers should, theoretically speaking, those numbers should come down each week. Yeah, at a, at a pretty steady sort of pace. So um, I have uh, Sam Pierce from World Gym Ashmore, a, a fellow IFBB pro do my um, pictures. He probably only gets to me, or I only get to him about a week, every week and a half. But um, I'm really big on just sort of, you know, looking at my own photos each Sunday, Sarah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's what skin folds are. Um, it's just, a, it's a way to test body fat. Yeah. Um, and it's um, it's much more, uh, it's much more accurate data uh, than, say, getting on the bathroom scales, you know, especially, like, uh, I think girls, I think women are really bad with bathroom scales. Like, throw them off the balcony, ladies. Like, don't worry about the scales. You don't need, you don't need the scales in your life. Get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I absolutely concur with that statement. So, yes, ladies, get rid of them. Now, we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions, and these are these are very interesting questions, I thought, and I would be very keen to hear what you have to say to them. Now, the first one comes from Chris. He's in London. It's recently uh, a show called Game Changers, and it talks about veganism and top-level vegan athletes. And the question is, um, have you ever been vegan? Would you ever go vegan? And what is your view on top-level athletes that have turned vegan? What, what are you, what are you okay. um, So I'll probably go specific first uh, because I've had first-hand experience being on stage with, um, with, a, with a vegan mm -hmm. and um, her name is Jocelyn. She, uh, she actually did the 2015 Amateur Olympia with me and she turned pro in the figure division as a vegan. Wow. Now, she didn't have a dissimilar physique to me um, but she was tall class so she was the winner of tall class and I was the winner of short class and we both ended up with pro status but um, she was vegan when she turned pro mm -hmm. so uh, looking back at her physique yeah it was um, you know it, it was muscular she had full round you know she had full round muscles she was extremely lean she had separation in the glutes which you kind of need when you're you know competing at that level in the figure division um, she, yeah, she looked phenomenal. She was vegan. Uh, and also she, um, she squats, she almost, she almost does like powerlifting style training in her off season and figure. So she hasn't competed for, actually, she hasn't even done her pro, pro debut. She had some mental health issues. Um, and, uh, she had to just step away from the stage um, but she's very, I, I love that she's so honest about all of that on Instagram, but that's a bit of a segue, but going back to her, she was powerlifting, uh, in her off season into the show where she turned pro, she was competing in the same division at the time as me and she was absolutely vegan and she looked incredible. Okay. Um, I also saw a guy called Verinda Singh who competed at the 2000, 
the 2012 FIDEX Pro Qualifier. Mm -hmm. So it was Luke Timms, Lucky Hatsapan Talas and Verinda Singh uh, in the men's Pro Q. And then I did the Pro Q with Summer Bernard, et cetera, et cetera. But that Verinda Singh guy, Tony rang the, you know, the Indian president of the IFBB, literally like they were like faxing each other. And, and on that day, um, they authorised his, um, his pro status. So Luke Timms turned pro on the stage and then they did some sort of um, exemption for this Indian guy and he actually turned pro on stage that day as well. And I remember what he looked like and he looked incredible. He was also vegan. Yes. And they both had female and male incredible physiques, muscular, lean, symmetrical, balanced. Um, and obviously they were training hard because they wouldn't have had the muscularity that they had had they not have been training hard now. I don't know, in answer to this guy's question, I don't know when they turned vegan. So did they put all that muscle on and did they build the foundations pre-veganism? Very possibly. I, I don't know. Sure. What a, Have I ever tried it? I've been vegetarian. I personally feel like but the amino acid requirements is are not met. You know, there's obviously there's eight amino acids, there's there's eight essentials, there's three muscle building aminos, and I don't believe that the amino acid profile looks the way it needs to look with a vegan diet. I am going to try plant based after this show. I mean, I've committed to giving that a try and just kind of guinea pigging it because I'm interested to see what it does to my gut health, to my digestion. And I'm also interested to see um, uh, what it does to my actual body composition. Mm. There's a lot of things that I'm curious about and I'm, and I am, it, I'm definitely going to try plant-based, but no, it won't, be, it won't be like full veganism. We've got one other question. Um, and this, this goes back to um, the sport itself and women in sport. And uh, here in the, in the UK, it's been quite a big social topic, if you like, which is the Me Too movement. And I know that, um, you know, the sport has come under fire um, over the years, even when I was competing, there was a, a little bit of um, sort of gripe about this. But the question is from Julia in, uh, in the UK, uh, up in Huddersfield in the north. And she asks what your view is to people saying that women in figure, bikini and bodybuilding are being objectified and the over-sexualization of women in fitness generally. What's your view on that? For me, Sarah, like, uh, I think if I go all the way back, what did I think when I first saw the girls on stage before I decided to ever get on stage? Honestly, I remember I was in England, I saw these girls on stage and I literally looked at these girls on stage and I absolutely, I admit, this is exactly what I said to myself, they are the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Like that is what, that is literally what my mind said. Like when I looked at these girls, they were so beautiful. They had the most beautiful bodies. And I was like, I just want to do that just once. Like, and that was literally the beginning. That was the seed for me that was planted when I first saw the girls on stage. I just thought they were just so beautiful. Like beautiful, but like just everything about them was beautiful. Now, I don't think that having aspirations, I don't believe that having aspirations to look beautiful is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously for me, uh, the, the drive and the passion that came very quickly and early on in the, in the piece for me with the sport, it wasn't, Sarah, it, was, it ran deeper than what, um, than, than what I physically was putting on stage. Yes, I'm, I've got a, um, a motivation to create something that looks aesthetically beautiful. Like I would be an idiot if I tried to deny that. Of course I do. I know that it looks beautiful. Like, you know, a, a be the, the finished product with the hair and the professional makeup and the, you know, the bling and the sparkly um, suit with all the Swarovski crystals all over it. Yeah, like, yes, I can see how people look at it and go, well, you're objectifying women. But, and now, now that I'm in a division that is even more, I'm going to use the word sexy, mm -hmm. you know, we do a 
it's pretty sexy. Like we've got a pretty sexy walk. Like, you know, the back pose is, is, you know, a lot of people have got a lot of thoughts and feelings about the bikini back pose. Um, you know, we're, we, our glutes are being judged by a panel of judges and sometimes there's a lot of males on that judging panel. So, yeah, I, I completely understand how you can look at you can look at it from the outside in and you can go, okay, like that whole scenario there, like that's just a straight up objectifying women. Mm. But I have never, ever, ever, absolutely hand on my heart, ever, ever looked at our sport like that because I, it's, it's a performance for me. Mm-hmm. Like I know that, you know, to like take sass onto stage and to take um, a bit of sexy onto stage and all of that is a part of the performance, but to me, it's performance, Sarah. It's absolutely not anything else. Like, if I, like, I'm an athlete and I just happen to wear a tiny little bikini on stage and, you know, we are judged on our physical, um, the physical condition and aesthetic of our body, but I've never, ever looked at it personally as a sport that where we are objectified um, or, you know, it's sexualized. I, I just have never looked at it like that. I, it's just um, to me, it's like, it's a, it's something that I do that I love and like, yeah, okay, like when we don't really wear many clothes on that. But seriously, if you go down to the local club in the Gold Coast or if you go to Surface Paradise and you walk down Caval Avenue at 9.30 on a Saturday night, I can tell you right now, the girls walking down the street, going in and out of the bars and clubs, they're wearing pretty much the same amount of clothes as what I wear when I'm on stage. <laughs> and, and, and it's in a controlled environment when we're competing. Yeah. Like there's no alcohol. There's no one walking around on drugs. There's no people that are out of control. There's none of those variables of people being wasted. Like you're out on the loose in the middle of like, you know, some mall, like where everyone's drunk and high and loaded. Mm. Like, we don't, we're not in that environment. So uh, as much as I understand it, Sarah, I just, I, mm, I'm just, I just sort of think, yeah, well, you know, like, uh, I, I think like pole dancing, like, um, you know, uh, um, news reporters allowed to wear like a, you know, a thing with a boobs popping out the top, like when they're reading the news, like, it's just Pandora's box. You could just open that right up, and where would it where would it finish? Cool. And is there is there any um, particular brands, businesses, um, uh, ambassadorship roles that you have with any companies that you'd like to mention? PM Labs. So they're my supplement sponsor. Food for Fitness. So they literally they do my customized meals that just come in little packages, and uh, they. They deliver them from New South Wales up to Queensland every Friday. Cylon stage, so the lovely Jo Rogers. I she's been making my suits for um, eleven years. Shumi.com.au, so they do all the stage heels. And I'm a brand ambassador for Carly Collective. You see, this has been an absolute treat, and we want to wish you from Wellnergy here in the UK, and also from myself personally absolute best of luck for your show in 24 days i'm sure you're going to kick ass and we would love to have you back on yeah no i'd be more than happy to come back on and thanks so uh, again so much for having me it's been great lovely thank you so much katie best of luck okay